Pacho, live from an undisclosed location. It's the YouTube channel that really hopes this video gets half as many views as the first one. It's Lightspeed Brothers. My video last year was focused on making the case that First Things First was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world when it came to sports talk. It was the new king. This year, I'm not going to even ponder whether it has retained that title. Because if you watch just one to two episodes of this show, you will know why that's not even a question worth debating. These guys are the GOATs. I want to talk about what has First Things First improved upon since I made that last video. What has it gotten worse at? And where is First Things First going in the next year? The 2022 NFL season was so special for the show because the guys felt like up-and-comers. Yes, First Things First had been around for years, but Jenna just left in August of 2022, and so this was the first time we were seeing exclusively Wilds, Nick, and Brew at the table together. So there was this fresh, raw energy to the show. The show is no longer in its underdog phase. It's the establishment now. Look at the YouTube channel. We now have YouTube shorts covering not just the sports takes of the three main analysts, but their personal interactions as well. And with the show becoming the establishment, gaining so much popularity, well, that comes with some good and some bad. Like, yes, the show now has a higher production value, which can really make some gags sing that wouldn't have worked last year. At the same time, I can't help but get the sense that whether it's the co-hosts or the people that are plotting these gags to put them into the show, I think there's a mentality behind the scenes that, alright, because we have this new money and new resources to use, we should use them nearly every day. I think the inclusion of the breakdancers on New Year's was the real low point for the show. It seemed as though even Nick and Wiles were annoyed, not in like a funny way like, aha, Brew got one over on us, but rather that this was a segment that was adding fluff to a show that ultimately should still be about sports. The show is getting a little too cute for its own good, and also, the big problem to me is last year, the joy of seeing the trumpets come out for Trevor is that these more extravagant gags were used rather sparingly, so they were such a surprise and a treat when they actually were implemented into the fabric of the show. Now, this NFL season, it feels like the Wild West on the show. Anything could happen on any segment on any given day, and I'm sure some people really like that, but for me, I would just like a little more shock factor to the gags. I think that's been a little lost in the second year. The first year was so awesome because Wilds was intensely committed to the bit. He was barely cracking a smile during the intros to Nick's tears, to under duress, to upset alert, not to mention the intensity he would bring to the intros when he was talking about burning the midnight oil, so on and so forth. Whereas this year, not only is he more relaxed, but also he's giggling, chortling through every single specialized segment they have. All the co-hosts are guilty of this to varying degrees. My thing is, if you're trying to be pseudo comedians, which let's be honest, they really are trying to be at this point, commit to the bit. While we all love it when our favorite comedians get a kick out of their own joke and start laughing up on stage, chuckling with it, I don't want the pace of the joke to be ruined by them laughing through the whole thing. And I think first things first can be guilty of that sometimes. But while the show can be a little too extravagant and self-indulgent for me at times, I cannot deny that we've gotten some heaters of segments because the show, the cast and crew are allowed to experiment and go over the top so frequently. Whether this be the Mac Jones intervention, Debo Dragon Purdy up the mountain, the First Things First Bowl, which is a top five moment in the show's history, we've gotten moments that were so ingenious, so joyous this year, that simply could not have been achieved in that first year because the show was a little more restrained. Not to mention, the second year also had a key strength that the first did not, and that was must win. And let me tell you, I could get fired up talking about must win, because the whole saga was so brilliant to witness. It debuting with such dynamite energy, and then getting removed because it was too stupid for the host to handle. And then the YouTube comment section, the passion of the fans, bringing it back to life, reviving it. It was just YouTube brilliance at its very, very best. Must win has so many perks to it. We get to consider future weeks of the season, the long-term playoff prospects of certain teams because of how frequently difficulty of schedule is cited during the segment. We get to see the guys talk about teams and players that maybe don't enjoy as much airtime as some other ones because the segment, by its very nature, is rapid fire. It goes through a couple of matchups, so we inevitably run into some teams that maybe don't get as much love as they deserve on the show. When I watch Must Win, I understand why the show tends to go over the top now, because when it does find that sweet spot of absurdity, it just sings. It is so entertaining to watch and hits a ceiling that the first year could not attain. I absolutely preferred the first year's approach to special moments, but I think this year had its perks too. And really, all the critiques I mentioned so far are not that big of a deal. They all pale in comparison to the one thing that I think really damaged the show this year, and that was the MVP debate. This was really intolerable, in my opinion, as the year progressed. And to me, it was proof that this show does not need to be on for an hour and a half every single day during the football season because they regurgitated this topic so much. And 
The argument was at an impasse. There was nothing to add to it. The debate may have been interesting at first, but it became clear so quickly that Nick and Brew were not going to agree about the merits of this player. And the pattern of the argument took on the same shape every single time or slightly adjusted. Nick would say that he needed to see Purdy have a come from behind victory, put the team on his back. And then Brew would say, oh, well, the team is so good and he's playing with such an immaculate passer rating that he never has to come from behind. Are we going to penalize him from that? And then Nick would reply, okay, but what does the eye test tell you, him versus Joe Montana? How many wows and yikes does he have? And the argument didn't evolve as the year progressed. There were no new beats added to it. This was the same old shtick, day in and day out. And then after we would hear Nick and Brew have their initial argument, then we would have to hear about what Micah Parsons thought about Brock Purdy and what George Kittle thought about Brock Purdy. Gee, one's on an opposing team, a rival team, and one is on the 49ers. I can't possibly imagine what they have to say about this player. And it was all for nothing. All of this debating was for nothing. Barack wasn't even an MVP consideration at the end of the year because after Lamar decimated the Niners, it was over. It was only Lamar. And then Brock comes back against the Lions in the playoffs, takes Patrick Mahomes to overtime, and Nick has not budged in the slightest when it comes to his opinion on Brock Purdy. He still has him insultingly low on Mahomes' mountain. And so I just have to wonder, what was all of that for? The show didn't even have a dedicated segment to talking about Cousins being out for the year after he quietly tore up one of the most formidable defenses in football, that being the Niners defense. And so it's not like the show was grasping for straws every day for content. There were smaller stories, interesting stories to tell in football, and instead of talking about them, they just beat this to death. Just for the Purdy discussion, I have to say that First Things First was worse this year because this was just so prevalent and so nauseating. And I feel as though they could have easily replaced some of these Purdy segments, not even with football stuff, but just NBA stuff, which seemed really ignored this year in comparison to that first go-around. Okay, but why is the show still so damn good? Largely the stuff I said last year and what's talked about in the comments every single day. Wilds, Nick, and Brew are such distinct personalities in an industry where the norm is to be a faceless nobody, where the norm is to be interchangeable. They each bring something unique to the table. Their personalities are different in so many facets, except for the fact that they're all so endearing. The guys are so likable, and the environment they create is warm. It's easy to immerse yourself in. With all these other sports shows that feel combative, it's nice to have one that truly feels like when you're listening, you're among friends. All of the men are articulate in their own regard, and... When you remove the histrionics, remove all the props, you can see that these guys have a really deft understanding of when to dial up the charisma, dial up the intensity of their takes, and when to really back and make it purely about the sport itself. And to me, the greatest representation of this is the segment immediately preceding the intro to the First Things First Bowl, right after Brew is shadow boxing and Nick is smoking a cigar. This is the show at the peak of its powers, in my opinion, and it's the antithesis of the Purdy stuff because Nick and Brew are really trying to have a debate with an ebb and flow to it. They both provide such encompassing looks at the Ravens and the Chiefs and all their strengths and weaknesses, and to me, the show just could have used more stuff like this, where Nick is talking about how the Chiefs are going to rely on their two corners and then try and send six of Lamar Jackson, and less stuff like just talking about whether Purdy is a game manager or not. Now... I don't want to make it seem as though that these segments are particularly rare, because you can rattle off many great ones like it, whether it be the post-mortem analysis to Packers Chiefs or the preview to Bills Bengals. These segments do happen, just it's not as guaranteed when it's just Nick Wilds and Brew. But man, when the guests are on, that's when you know the show means business. In this second First Things First video, I want to shout out the unsung heroes of the show this year, specifically Greg Jennings and Coach Mangini. I'm not going to even discuss their personalities for a second. I want to talk about what their mere presence means, because it means, first off, we're not going to get the most extravagant gag on the show while they're on the air. It also means that Nick Wilds and Brew are going to be a little more composed than usual. Why do I think that is? Well, I think they recognize that these other special guests, they don't have unlimited time to play with. They are called upon for select appearances, and so the three main stars really want to make sure these other guys' voices are heard. They are less likely to interrupt them. When they actually disagree with Jennings, with Mangini, they offer for substantive replies, which they're less likely to give with each other. They're more likely to give the pot shot. When these guys are on the air, the show is much more successful at maintaining the balance between being playful and professional at the same time. 
With Jennings and Mangini, it's not just the extra layer of credibility that comes with playing and coaching the game, although that is important. It's also that because these guys weren't trained, bred to be sports analysts, they talk a little different than the three main guys. They come at football from a slightly different way, so that adds not only more variety to the opinions that you encounter on the show, but it also just adds points that you may have never thought of. I mean, you gotta love Mangini for being this old school remnant from the Patriots era, someone who's very matter of fact, he has a more subtle dry delivery than all the other guys when it comes to his jokes, but that's why he's so special. He's a lot more of a restrained personality and it fits in so well with these larger than life figures sitting around the table. And I love Greg for being the ultimate wild card. With the other guys, you can kind of use a portfolio of their opinions to predict what they're going to say on certain matters. But with Greg, he can come at any argument from any angle without feeling contrarian. There's just an unpredictability he has, and it's so refreshing to have that on a show like this. Moreover, that means that we can get some high highs and some low lows out of Greg. That means he can predict Lions over Chiefs in the first game of the year, or he can die with the Daniel Jones ship. And it's so nice to be on that Josh Allen-esque roller coaster with him. The show is at its best when these guys are on it. Now, when they're not on it, the show is still stellar most of the time. I just can't help but feel as though this year, I think the show was feeling itself a little too much and it got too crazy over the Brock Purdy debate when it could have been focused on other football stories or stuff about the NBA. But regardless of whether you think the show was worse, better, or exactly the same as it was in its first year, I think we can all agree that First Things First is special. This entity is remarkable, and we should all be grateful for the people both in front and behind the camera that make it what it is. A combination of sports and wit, the likes of which we have never seen and may never see again. It is something to cherish while it is still on, and who knows how long it'll still be on in its current form. But man, we may have been born too early for flying cars, too late to see the renaissance but we were born in time to see first things first live and that that is something to be happy about